Today on America's Test Kitchen, Julia shows Bridget how to make the best cast iron steak. Adam reviews paper towel holders with Bridget in the equipment corner. Lisa gives us the gadget guru hall of shame. And Dan makes Julia the ultimate crisp roast butterfly chicken. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. Cast iron skillets are making a comeback. They're the original nonstick pan that our grandmothers used long before Teflon came around. They're inexpensive and nearly indestructible. And you can use them to make everything from a loaf of bread or an apple pie to the best steak of your life. A cast iron skillet is probably the only piece of kitchen gear that improves after years of heavy use. Seasoning it couldn't be easier. Scrub it with hot water, wipe it dry, add one half teaspoon of vegetable oil to the skillet on medium low heat, and rub with paper towels until dark and shiny. Here's the good news. Each time you season your pan, you build up that gorgeous non-stick patina. And today, here in America's Test Kitchen, we're cooking everything in cast iron. So as I mentioned, this steak recipe is the whole reason I am now a proud owner of a 12-inch cast iron pan. Well, that's going to come in handy because you did just promise me, am I right, the best steak that I'm ever going to have. You know it. So I'm going to put my order in. <laughs> I would like a steak with a nice crust on the outside, juicy on the inside, and medium rare. You got it. Now the key to such a steak is getting this cast iron pan ripping hot. And of course, here in the test kitchen, we tested a lot of ways to heat up the skillet. We found that the oven worked best. So I'm gonna put this guy in the oven, 500 degrees, and when the oven's hot, which will take about half an hour, this bad boy in it, that skillet will be perfectly hot. All right, so while that skillet is heating up in the oven, let's take a look at this beautiful steak I have for you. Wow, I'm looking. <laughs> so this is a lot of me. There's one for you, one for me. I now, like the way you think. <laughs> actually, this would serve four people, because this is two pounds of meat, and it's about an inch and a half thick. And that's important because you want there to be enough time to get a good sear on each side without making the steak overcook because you said you want a medium rare. You listened. I'm listening. All right, so I'm just going to put some salt on these New York strip steaks and I'm going to let them sit while the skillet heats up. That, of course, helps enhance that beefy flavor. All right, so let's set these guys aside. I'm just going to wash my hands before we continue. And I have another surprise for you, which is on top of our gorgeous steaks, I'm going to put a little butter little flavorful butter, because you are no stranger to butter. <laughs> so I have here a shallot. I'm going to mince this up. This should give us about two tablespoons of minced shallot. Now you want to cut it up just like you would an onion, but you want to use the tip of the knife. So here, first I'm going to slice down, then I'm going to slice across, and then make it into a nice fine mince. Now I'm just going to run my knife over this a couple more times, make sure those pieces are nice and finely minced. We used to get graded on this in culinary school too. The chef would go in here and they'd look for the largest piece they could find and they'd pull it out and say, uh-uh, that's enough. Really? Yes. So now I'm a very fine mincer. All right, so I'm going to add this shallot to four tablespoons of unsalted butter. Now we're going to add a little bit of parsley. This is, of course, the parsley leaves. I'm just going to mince this up. It's about a tablespoon of minced parsley. Now we're going to put a few chives into our butter. We're just going to cut these very finely. All right, so that's about a tablespoon of chives. Last but not least, a little garlic. This is a small clove of garlic. A little salt, a little pepper. We're just going to mash this all together to make our very flavorful compound butter. All right, so this pan is screaming hot. It's been in here for a good half an hour, which is why I have my industrial heat-proof mitten on. All right, so here's a nifty thing. Slide this on your skillet. It'll help prevent you burning yourself as you walk by. You know me too well. Before we get cooking, we're going to finish patting our steaks dry because they've been salting for a while, so a little moisture has come to the surface. And moisture prevents browning from happening, so you want to pat it away and we're gonna season it with a little pepper so our steaks are ready to go. So we're gonna put this skillet over medium-high heat, add two tablespoons of vegetable oil, and really get this oil smoking before we add the steaks. And again, that doesn't take very long because this skillet is screaming hot. So I see some smoke on that oil, so it's time to get going. In go the steaks. Ooh, oh yeah. Mmm. 
So the cooking time on these steaks is about nine minutes total. But every two minutes, we're gonna flip it over, and that ensures an even crust and even cooking throughout the steak. And about halfway through, we're gonna turn the heat down to medium low, because if you don't, you're actually gonna get too thick of a crust on these steaks, believe it or not. Well, that is a far cry from what we always say. We always say, put it in the pan and leave it alone and don't touch it. Don't even look at it for at least <laughs> five minutes. But you're saying this every two minutes is really the key for more evenly cooked meat. That's right. And I am not above using a timer because this steak is worth every second. And every penny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's been about two minutes on this first side. Ah! Oh, that's not even the final crust, honey. That's just the base layer of crust. The crust that builds on top of this. I'm telling you, best steak ever. All right, so it's been about two minutes on that second side. Oh. Mm, yeah, so I'm gonna flip them back over. And now, as I mentioned before, we're gonna turn the heat down to medium low. Because these steaks need to cook for another three to four minutes. And you can tell this crust would almost get too thick if we left that heat too high. So medium low, another three to four minutes. This actually reminds me of is back in the 70s, <laughs> when I used to lay out on a lounge chair and try to get tan. And I would flip <laughs> over every few minutes just to cool down. But luckily, I never developed a substantial crust. <laughs> That's right. So we're sun tanning these steaks for about another <laughs> two minutes. All right, let's flip these guys over. Look at that crust. I mean, that is not a crust you see outside of a really good grill or a killer five-star restaurant. All right, so these steaks have been in the pan for about seven or eight minutes, and it's time to take their temperature. All right, so we're looking at a temperature of about 120 or so on the nose, so let's get these guys out of that hot pan. Cool. Let's turn the pan off, slide that off the burner a bit. Oh, good night. Oh, isn't that just the best looking steak you've ever seen? All right, just because we can. Just a little butter. I'm just gonna put it. <laughs> it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. As you know, we gotta let this sit for about five to 10 minutes before we slice into it. But let me tell you, the weight is gonna be worth it. <laughs> of course, I'm gonna tent it with foil, help keep the heat in. Foil, keeping the heat in, keeping the Bridget out. All right, Bridget, the time has come. Oh, the smell of that butter <laughs> melting over the hot steak. Are you kidding me? All right, so it's time to slice into this guy. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Not much of a gray band right there. And look at that red center. And seriously juicy. All right, let me get some of these pieces right from the middle for you that have a whole bunch of that butter. I might just steal a little butter from the other steak. Oh, yeah. There you go. Look at that. Mm, mm, mm. All right, I'm going in. Mm -hmm. If you don't hear from me in a few days, call my family and tell them I love them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Need to take a breather? <laughs> Isn't that good? You don't actually need teeth to eat this. It is so tender. Mm hmm Oh, my gosh. Mm. Melt in your mouth. America, I am pleading with you. You need to buy a cast iron skillet. This pan makes a killer crust on steaks, and it all comes down to time and temperature. Preheat the skillet in a 500-degree oven and then move it to the stovetop. Meanwhile, you need to salt flavorful strip steaks and then sear them in that hot skillet. Flip the steaks over every two minutes to build a substantial crust and then cook them through evenly. Dollop the cooked steaks with an easy herb compound butter and there you have it. From our test kitchen to your kitchen, the best dinner that you will ever have, no fooling, cast iron steaks. It has one job, and that's to hold paper towels. Adam is here to discuss the core issues of paper towel holders and tell us which one is best. In my mind, tearing off a sheet of paper towels comes as close to a mindless task in the kitchen as you are ever going to get. You just want to rip it off, you want to have it be neat and precise, and go about your business. It's not going to happen if your paper towel roll is just sitting on the counter. And as our testers learned, it is not going to happen if you have the wrong paper towel holder. We tested six different paper towel holders. The price range was $13 to $25. We tested them on partial rolls, standard rolls, jumbo rolls. We tested them on every kind of roll we could get our hands on. We tore them off one-handed, two-handed. We tore off big sheets. We tore off little sheets. We tore off half sheets. We tested them in every possible way. 
Now, the design is pretty much the same for most of these, and you can see that here. There's just a base with a center post to hold your roll of paper towels. There were a couple of issues that arose as part of the testing. The first one was weight. This thing has to be stable. It's got to be secure on the counter. If it was too light, it flopped around. Pick up this little boy. Oh, light as a feather. Just a little over 12 ounces. Ooh. Did not cut the mustard. Try this one. Really? Oh, I could lift weights with this. Exactly. <laughs> Forget about the gym membership. Use a paper towel holder. This one was two pounds, six ounces. Two pounds was the magic number. If it was less than two pounds, it really wasn't stable enough. Now, that was the case with this one. This one was a pound, five ounces. The manufacturer tried to compensate for that by putting a suction cup on the ah. bottom. So you have to turn this knob here. Sometimes <laughs> it was a little finicky. And it sticks yeah. if you get it working, but then it comes Doesn't undone. Yep. If it comes undone, it's way too light to be stable and secure. Also, if you want to bring your roll of paper towels with you, you have to undo it if it's stuck. Sure. Tester's not impressed. Two of them had these fins, these sort of flexible fins sure. in the center post. That was supposed to provide resistance so you could just rip off a sheet easily. Tester's not impressed with that <laughs> either. We're gonna walk on down. This one actually had silicone pads built into the base. Those are supposed to provide resistance. They just got linty. Testers were not impressed. Second flaw with this one is this top cap right here. <laughs> you have to take it off every time oh. you want a load of a roll of paper towels. That was just an extra step that testers didn't want to think about. The best resistance aid was some sort of helper arm, but there are helper arms and there are helper arms. <laughs> this is the wrong kind of helper arm. This one is set into the base, it's fixed in place, and it's parallel to the center post. There's about two inches of distance between the post and the helper arm. We have a partial roll of paper towels. Let's just rip off a sheet. So you can't do it with one hand. You can't do it with one hand. There's just too much space. It doesn't provide resistance. Let's get rid of that and just load on a new roll. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jumbo not. rolls don't fit. Definitely not a good system. We're going to take that off. We're going to put this back on. We're moving on to our last one here. This was the best kind of helper arm you could have. This is a spring-loaded tension arm, and it adjusts for the width of the paper towel roll. It's easy to put on a big jumbo roll like that. Impressive. And as you use paper towels and the roll gets thinner and thinner, the tension arm will follow with you and provide resistance with this big pad here. It was our winner, hands down. It's got this little helpful loop right up top, easy to pick up and carry. It was $24.99. It's the Simple Human Tension Arm Paper Towel Holder, and it's all we could ever ask for in a paper <laughs> towel holder. Well, there you go. If you want the last paper towel holder that you'll ever need, then try the Simple Human Tension Arm Paper Towel Holder at $24.99. Today, I'm sauteing my fingers in the name of science. Now, this is a cast iron skillet, and this is an aluminum core stainless steel skillet. Both are heating on medium on this induction cooktop. And now, I get to say something I've always wanted to say, don't try this at home. Now, there's a common belief that cast iron pans are great because they heat evenly. Cast iron is actually a relatively poor heat conductor, especially compared to the aluminum core of this stainless steel skillet. Now, it's actually gonna take about eight times longer to burn my finger on the cast iron than it did on this stainless steel. This slower heating causes the pan to develop hot spots. You can see that clearly here in this experiment we did using flour. Now, for that reason, our favorite method of preheating a cast iron skillet is to place it in a cold oven, crank the heat to 500 degrees, and let it slowly but evenly heat through. Now the good news is that once cast iron gets hot, it stays hot. Thick, dense, heavy cast iron skillets retain thermal energy incredibly well, giving you the best possible sear on your steak, and proving the point that cast iron cooking is definitely worth the wait. I started fiddling around with butterfly chicken recipes about 12 years ago here in the test kitchen, and I've fallen in love with the method because you get golden mahogany colored skin and juicy meat in under an hour. But Dan has taken this recipe to a whole new level by putting it in a cast iron skillet. That's right. So Julia, 
cast iron is the perfect material for this recipe. And there's a couple of reasons for it. One is the sides are usually pretty high on cast iron pan, so all that splattering that you normally deal with mm -hmm. with a normal skillet, you don't have to worry about. The second thing is once cast iron gets really hot, it stays that way. The flip side to that is it takes a long time to heat cast iron up. Mm -hmm. People think it heats evenly. It doesn't actually heat evenly. It's actually quite uneven. You need to heat it very slowly to get that nice even heat distribution. So to that end, we actually have it in the oven right now. So I put it into a cold oven on the lowest rack and then heat it to 500 degrees. So I preheat it with the oven. It's gonna be really hot all across the board. Mm -hmm. And that takes about half an hour. About half an hour, exactly. So you don't wanna skimp on that. That's really important for really good browning. So now we can turn to the chicken here. And I've got a three and a half pound chicken, which is perfect for this recipe. We're gonna spatchcock it. Mm -hmm. It's really simple to do. All you need is a pair of scissors. And by spatchcock, Mr. Fancy Pants here means we're gonna butterfly. Exactly. So what I'm gonna do is start on the back here. I'm gonna cut up both sides around the backbone and then we'll just take it out. It's very satisfying to take the backbone out of the chicken, <laughs> I gotta say. Now the real question is, what are you gonna do with that backbone? I've actually got a bag set up right here. So once you're all chickeny, you go looking for a Ziploc bag. I'm gonna put this in here. Later on, I'll zip it up, throw it in the freezer. Mm -hmm. When I have enough meat, I'll make stock with it. Nice. Yeah, it's really good flavor in there. All right, so now that that's taken out, I'm gonna flip it back over and I'm gonna press down on the breast and crack the keel bone just so it lays nice and flat. That way we get browning here and here all at the same time. And then you wanna turn the legs like that so that they're all kind of facing out this way. Mm -hmm. You don't want it in this way, okay? Gotcha. Make sure that's pressed down. And then I'm gonna tuck the wings, just like that. We don't want those to brown too quickly. Mm -hmm. This will get nice coverage there. All right, so now I'm gonna season the bird up. There's some good meat in here that we normally don't have access to when we're roasting a whole bird. So it's really nice. I wanna get that with some salt. And we'll get a little pepper. And flip back over. And we want the skin to be dry so that it browns really rapidly. So I have some paper towel here, just pat it nice and dry. And I have a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil. So we're just gonna drizzle this over. You don't need a lot of oil because once that skin starts to render, you have tons of fat in the skillet. Mm -hmm. This is just when it first goes in, get a nice barrier there. So just rub this in. Again, season on this side. And a little more pepper. So this guy's all set. I'm gonna pull the skillet out of the oven. and I'm gonna turn the oven down to 450. I had it at 500, 500 is a little too hot for the whole cook process. Now, I have a present for you. I Ooh. just discovered these. Yes, it's a silicone handle that you can slide over any hot pot handle cool. so you won't burn yourself. Oh, nice. And it's just a note to everybody in the kitchen that that handle is hot. So this skillet is obviously really hot, just yep. came out, so I'm gonna pop this guy in. We're gonna go, Ooh, there we go, it sounds good, right? That's a good sound. You wanna go breast side down. Mm -hmm. Obviously we're gonna get the browning from the pan, not mm -hmm. as much from the oven. So gotcha. we wanna go skin side down. And you said this was a three and a half to four pound chicken. I'd imagine you can't go any larger or else it wouldn't fit. Exactly, yep, you wanna be careful with that. All right, so I'm gonna go into the oven. Let me get the oven for you. Thank you very much. So that's gonna be in there for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. All right. So the chicken is cooking away in there, getting nice and brown. It's almost ready. Mm -hmm. So before I pull that out, I'm gonna mix up a little oil that's gonna go on the top once we flip it. Really flavorful stuff, super simple. I got a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil, a teaspoon of minced garlic, and a teaspoon of minced rosemary. Oh, nice. Just good classic chicken flavors. This is all about simplicity. Okay, there we go. Time to pull this guy out. Oh, that smells good. Smells really good, doesn't it? I'll get the oven for Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to leave this in here skin side on the entire time, because what's happening is the heat is being transferred from the pan into the breast. We're getting a lot of moisture out, and that's dropping the temperature of the pan as well. So if we leave it in there, eventually it's going to start to sog out the skin. So we've got really good browning. We're going to flip it, and then we'll just let it dry a little bit more in the oven. Okay. Ooh, 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 ooh. That looks good. Oh, that's a looker. Okay, so before this goes in, I'm gonna hit it with our rosemary garlic oil here. All right, and then I'm just gonna spread this around, get nice even coverage. Mmm. Ooh, the smell of that garlic and rosemary as it hits the pan and the chicken. I know. Ooh, so it's getting really fragrant in here. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go back into the oven, just another 10 minutes. We're looking for 165 in the breast, 175 in the thigh. All right. Ooh, oh, that looks good. That's a beauty. Now let's see if I nailed the temp here. I'm looking for 165, 
Plus 165. All right. We nice got it. Done. Dan. Good numbers, good looks. Mm -hmm. Let's pull her out. I'll get the door for you. Thank you very much. Oh, that looks so good. Oh, man. Well done. Awesome, right? Yeah. So now I'm going to transfer it to our nice carving board over here. So we're going to let this rest for about 15 minutes before we carve into it. But we're not going to cover it because we want that skin to stay nice and crispy. Mm -hmm. And it's very crispy right now. I think 15 minutes is about all you can wait for this it's chicken. True. Right? I mean, it's it, just too gorgeous. It's too gorgeous. It's important, so it's rested, but we can't wait any longer. So I'm just going to carve it up. Now I notice you're using a boning knife to carve the chicken. Yes. And that's because it's a bit more flexible and the curve on the blade just makes it easier to get in there? Exactly. Yep. You get in there a little bit easier and I, I like that kind of maneuverability. Mm -hmm. You can definitely do it with a chef's knife. I actually sometimes use a paring knife to do it. Ah. You get really close in there. This is a little bit long in that way. Okay, we got some white meat there. Can I give you a little bit of both? A little bit of both. You gotta try them both, right? Yeah. I just can't get over how brown this skin is. That is it's the, beautiful. Yeah, one of the biggest reasons why I love this method. Oh, that's really good. <laughs> mm. It's just so simple. I mean, it's perfectly roasted chicken, just a little garlic and rosemary. Sometimes simple is the best mm. way, mm -hmm. you know? And it's just perfectly cooked in 40 minutes. Yep. I mean, that's well under an hour. Mm hmm. Mm. That's great. Well seasoned, mm -hmm. it's chickeny, a little bit of flavor from the garlic and rosemary, but it's all about the chicken here. Oh, nice job. Thank you. The key to a perfectly roasted spatchcock chicken is to use a cast iron skillet. Start by heating the pan up in the oven until it's ripping hot, then lay the butterflied chicken skin side down in the pan and roast it. To prevent that beautifully brown skin from turning soggy, flip the chicken skin side up for the last 10 minutes of roasting and brush it with a flavorful garlic oil. So there you have it. From the test kitchen to your kitchen, a killer recipe for crisp roast butterflied chicken with rosemary and garlic. You can get this recipe, all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings and testings and selected episodes on our website, americastestkitchen.com. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.